Okay, so Jonathan Felt uh, was born in Jackson County, Missouri, in the urban city of Kansas in the late 1950s. His yearnings for Zion have never abated from that day until today. He can remember the nursery and his own circumcision, can't you? Little did he know just how strong that desire for the gathering of Israel would become as time progressed. He and his wife, Melody, have seven children. He has a deep friendship and genuine love for his personal uh, boss, who is a devoted member of the Shabbat community in Brooklyn, New York. He and his own, he and his boss, uh, program software systems for Amazon sellers, especially those of the Jewish Brotherhood. Jonathan's career in computer programming started when he was a young married general contractor in 1987. At the time, he maintained apartments and managed them for his well-to-do bosses and the Salt Lake uh, County Housing Authority. As his skills increased on the computer, he places his places of domicile and employment included Salt Lake City, Utah, Monroe, Louisiana, uh, Keene, New Hampshire, St. Petersburg, Florida, San Diego, California, Amenadam, India, and Brooklyn, New York. He served a fulfilling two years for his church in Sadai, Japan. He currently resides in Utah uh, in the little old hamlet of Leland, which is the same ward precinct as the famous bishop, John Hiram Coyle. The name Felt uh, has migrated from the Celtic name, probably Felty, uh, to Felts, to Felch, to Felt in 1601 when, hers, when his ancestors mostly inhabited the region around Salem, Massachusetts and have for the last 400 years or so. His family more recent, his family's more recent advent to Mormonism was in 1843 when Brigham Young sized up his great and grand second great grandfather, Nathaniel. Since he wasn't the best student of his era, no greatness will be found there, but he briefly studied business at the University of Utah before dropping out to get to work. His presentation is titled Rav Mosh and the Torah Timim Timima will heal the nations. All right, we've got a timer over there, so have at it. Sorry, you have to hold the mic. Share. Will be, yeah. There you go. Yep. All I got to do is what? Just click on it. Thank you. A little bit hot the mic but uh, that's okay <laughs> i like hot mics <laughs> rob moshe um, is what we call him in brooklyn of course you'll call him that anywhere you're in, you're among uh, orthodox jews and uh, really that word means great teacher um, you won't be allowed to say anything less of Moses, that's for sure. And uh, I'm going to abbreviate my talk because I think there's a more important message that follows me. And so I hope more people can join. But um, starting on 2 Nephi verses uh, 25 verse 20, and now my brethren, I have spoken plainly that ye cannot err. And as the Lord God liveth, that brought Israel up out of the land of Egypt, comma. Uh, Eugene and I have been uh, struggling through learning Hebrew. And Flynn, oh yes, he's here. Flint's in the back, and there's many more of us. Uh, Joshua and a few others have contributed. But look at this interesting Hebrew Jude um, passage. It's not been approved by the committee yet. It does go through a process. But he says it's my desire to remind you because you once firstly knew this, or you once knew this, but it could also mean firstly. And for Yehovah, not the Lord, but Yehovah has brought his people out from Egypt a second time. 
You notice where the comma is because it could also mean secondly. So you have a hot, which is up the top, the second line down, which means once or firstly. And then you have shanit, uh, shanit, shanit, shanit. Anyway, I got my, my time. No. So is his people coming out of Egypt the second time, or is it secondly and afterward he destroyed them from the unbelievers? Well, yes and yes. And so, like so many things that are in Hebraisms, it's both. And so, let's see. I do have that. I already made that announcement. We do have a committee that does Hebrew translation. You're welcome to join us. I wish you would. Um, there is so much to learn. Biblical Hebrew is so different that most Jews today do not know it. They know some of the words. They can kind of hear it like another dialect, but they don't know it. So you're learning with them if you're, if you're working with us. And so like the King James uh, Committee, we work on it every night. And uh, we give our comments. And I'll let uh, Eugene kind of uh, go over that a little bit. But I brought with me, uh, Rhonda will know this, or uh, yes, agree. You'll know this book very well, but uh, I brought one of some of these with me um, because Abraham Gileadi does such a good job of showing that there are more than one timeline in Scripture, and they're both going on simultaneously. So as we saw with the Jude Scripture, God's going to bring us out of Egypt for a second time, a second time. So this has been long shown or demonstrated by Abraham Gileadi. And now we're being validated, or he is being validated. The Book of Mormon is being validated by what we're calling the Hebrew New Testament. It's very important to know what's being restored right now in front of our eyes and that you can participate in that. I also brought some uh, Emma hymnals. Uh, if you want to buy one, uh, this is the hymn book right here. And uh, hymn number 90 has an interesting couple of stanzas we've, we've missed, but especially uh, stanza five. <laughs> I love this. Uh, so this is something you once knew that you forgot about the spirit of God like a fire is burning. You forgot it because tradition has overtaken you. Time has overtaken you. Decisions have overtaken you. It's a little microcosm of what's happened to the church generally since Jude was on the earth. Who was Jude? He was the brother of James. Who was James? He was Jacob. He was an apostle. He was James of Peter, James, and John. He was the brother of who? Yeshua. Yeshua, his brother. The book of James is amazing. And you will not be disappointed if you join us. Old Israel that fled from the world for his freedom. You've heard this. Must come with the cloud and the pillar. Amen. Remember singing that in church? No. A Moses and Aaron and Joshua lead him. And feed him on man from heaven again. We'll sing and we'll shout. Okay, if you haven't sung it, Why? What's wrong with that verse? Sounds kind of cool, doesn't it? <laughs> kind of break things up. Maybe they didn't have room. Maybe they didn't have room for that little paragraph at the bottom. I don't know. Or maybe something else is going on. All right. Verse 20, the second half. And, and gave unto Moses power that he should heal the nations after they had been bitten by the poisonous serpents if they would cast their eyes unto the serpent, which he did raise up before them, and he also gave him power that he could smite the rock, and the water should come forth. Yea, behold, I say unto you, that as these things are true, and as the Lord God liveth, there is none other name given under heaven, save it be this Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, right? of which I have spoken, whereby man can be saved. Is the Book of Mormon Hebraic? Well, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. And here's an example. I like this. Where for this cause hath the Lord God promised unto me that these things which I write, who's that? Who's I? It's Nephi, right? Which I write shall be kept and preserved and handed down unto my seed from generation to generation. Whose seed? The remnant of Jacob. From generation to generation, that the promise may be fulfilled unto Joseph that his seed should never perish as long as the earth should stand. Well, which Joseph? Um, yes and yes. Um, Gene and I have been out scouring around the country and, and we've met some of Joseph's seed, one in particular, and his seed is gonna be preserved also. And aren't we sons of Joseph in that way? I think we are. So you have Joseph and you have Joseph and you have a preservation of his work. Do you not with Jeremiah and Baruch, right? Remember the uh, fun story of, of uh, Yo let's see, Jehoiakim, the king, and, and uh, Jeremiah sending uh, Baruch to see the king and the king, uh, well, no, he read it to the people as how it goes. And, this is God's word coming from Jeremiah. And eventually the king gets it and with disdain and with his razor, he cut off the pieces that were, that were uh, read from verse to verse or from sentence to sentence. What did he do? He threw it into the, the brazier, the brazier, the, the fire that's made of brass. And guess what? Joseph had 116 pages lifted from him and yet the book of mormon comes out no matter what because god preserves his word that's a hebraism is god hebraic i would say yes so what we have now is what's called a hepuk shel debar hepuk shel debar is a reversal of words it's a reversal of circumstances. The king throws the word of the Lord into the fire, and what does the Lord do? He brings it back. He reverses us. We're constantly being reversed because we don't understand. God has no shadow of changing, does he? He doesn't need us. He doesn't need our understanding. We can sit outside of understanding and knowledge all we want, and we do. We happily do it. Every good endowment, every completed gift is from above, and it descends from the Father of light, which does not end. He's never pressed out in him. Neither variableness nor shadow of reversal. Is that a Hebraism? Absolutely. Wherefore, these things shall go from generation to generation, as long as the earth shall stand, and they shall go according to the will and pleasure of God. And the nations who shall possess them shall be judged of them according to the words which are written. I've seen other nations. I've seen how they preserve God's law, his instructions through their law. Even India conducts every scrap of business in English. English law is based on, goes back all the way to Moses, doesn't it? For we labor diligently to write and to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to believe and to be reconciled to God. The Hebrew James does not use Christ as a word. They do not use this, the, uh, the Greek. They use Yeshua, Hamashiach. For God, he uses Elohim properly, or Yehovah properly. There are a lot of people that get a little cringy about the word Yehovah. Why? I think it's because of tradition. It's on the record with the pronunciation, with the vowel points. Go ahead and say it. Yehovah, not Jehovah. Use the Y, okay? Gileadi got it right, by the way. He used Yehovah, 
or Jehovah. So, where we labor diligently after. So here we go. We labor diligently to write and to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in the Messiah and to be reconciled to Elohim. We know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. Is that a Hebraism? Absolutely. After all we can do. In Brooklyn, you have these what's called mitzvah tanks. And they are uh, wonderful mobile outreach centers that uh, allow my brethren, my Jewish brethren, your brothers, the seed, the remnant of Jacob, right? Those that are doers of God's word, or they do mitzvah, we say commandment, but it's a precept, it's a decree, it's an edict, it's a good deed, it's an act of kindness. In other words, do God's word, and you do the act of kindness. Please be doers of the word and not hearers alone, deceiving yourselves, leading yourselves astray. You notice, uh, um, yeah, that's a little bit pedantic, as they say about me, but I love language now that I've gotten a taste of it. And there's even a connection, I think, to Japanese, which um, we can talk about if you ever wanted to. But whoso, and this is kind of one of those funny uh, scriptures that uh, Zarahemla Foundation, uh, others will use because... Uh, it seems to kind of get close. King James is close. And we say, that must mean Torah, right? That must mean Torah. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. What's a perfect law, by the way? Isn't that Torah temima? Isn't that what James referred to as the pure, innocent, perfect, fulfillable Torah? Yeah, perfect law of liberty. Why liberty, anyway? No idea why King James decided to use that word. And continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. That's pretty close. But what does James say? Yaakov. Whoever examines himself by the pure Torah, Torah temima, which is the law of the inspector. Who is the inspector? That's the chief high priest of Aaron, isn't it? one that inspects the sacrifices. And if he, and it's also the Lord, obviously, the priest stands in for the Lord to inspect the physical sacrifice so that your sacrifice, that's higher sacrifice, that with the broken heart and the contrite spirit, is inspected to make sure that it's good, it's worthy. And if he will stand according to the law, and not hear it in forgetfulness. And if he will labor to do it, his blessings and happiness are in his deeds. So we do use Torah and we use Torot for instruction or law. So my deceptions or progressions, there are many. I tell you, if I can encourage you to get out and be deceived, I think that's a good idea. Don't hold back. Don't worry about it. Um, you can't progress without it. Um, you can ask me any question you want about my deceptions, if you're interested. Um, and notwithstanding we believe in Christ, we keep the law of Moses and look forward to the stead with steadfastness unto mes uh, the, the Messiah until the law shall be fulfilled. We have all manner of excuses about the law being fulfilled. We use all different kinds of grammar to justify our precondition that it was done away. But there are other viewpoints, believe me. Hebrew Matthew says, and at the time Yeshua said to his disciples, do not think that I have come to annul the Torah, but to fulfill it. Truly, I say to you that until heaven and earth depart, not one letter or dot shall be abolished from the Torah or the prophets, because all will be fulfilled. I don't see that has happened yet. So I don't see how we get away with saying it's been done away. And I'll give you $100 if you can show me who ordered you to do away with the law of Moses. Show me. 
show me, other than maybe a Catholic Pope along the way, and maybe our traditions. Perfect and imperfect. There are two grammar conditions in Hebrew, only two. Now in modern Hebrew, they've added our third, which is future tense. They have two. It's either perfect or imperfect. It means it's been fulfilled, done. Imperfect means not done. Future perfect, it's another form of perfect, sounds like it's done, but is yet to come. Okay? Believe me, it's there. Come and study with us. If you remember some of those uh, interesting passages about um, something about the, the law being fulfilled. For uh, as this end was the given law, the law for, uh, for, for this end, now that's an interesting word, end, uh, was the law given, wherefore the law hath become dead unto us, and we are made alive in Christ, the Messiah, because of our faith, yet we keep because of faith. That's another key word. Is that a Hebraism? Yes. Yet we keep the law because of the commandments. Wouldn't it be a good idea if we probably did that ourselves? A little bit of err on the side of caution instead of assuming we've done a higher thing somehow. And we talk of Christ. We rejoice in Christ. We preach of Christ. And we prophesy of Christ. And we write according to our prophecies that our children may know to what source they may look for remission. In, in Hebrew James, moreover, in truth, when faith is without good deeds, faith itself dies. And if you will say, you are, the you are the man of faith and I am the man of deeds, I will determine your faith from your deeds and I will declare my faith from my deeds. Mind your own business and do your mitzvah. Do your commandments, do your good. Don't do the low, the, the low mitzvah, the no, don't do's. Do the mitzvah. Wherefore we speak concerning the law that our children may know the deadness of the law. And they, by knowing the deadness of the law, they look forward unto that life which is in Christ and not for what end the law was given. Remember the end of the law. And after the law is fulfilled in Christ, that they need not harden their hearts against him when the law ought to be done away. Well, I think we would all say, look, we're pretty good people. It ought to be done away, right? We don't need to follow that. Well, don't be hard in your heart against Jesus because he hasn't lifted that from you yet. And you've heard the hope of Job, James says, and it has an end. Think about hope of Job. What, what was the hope of Job? Didn't he see God after all his trials and through all of that? His hope was seeing God. It has an end in my Lord. You have seen him. You're reading that and you're saying, oh, I didn't see him. But guess what? You will. And your hope is in seeing him. So... You will fulfill the law of Moses. You haven't yet. Jesus may have. You haven't. And now behold my people. You are a stiff-necked people. Wherefore I have spoken plainly unto you that you cannot misunderstand. And the words which I have spoken shall stand as a testimony against you. For they are sufficient to teach any man the right way. It's all there. The instructions are there. You don't need any more. For the right way is to believe in the Messiah and deny him not. For by denying him, you deny, you also deny the prophets and the law. Doesn't that sound a little bit familiar? Now behold, I say unto you that the right way is to believe in Christ and deny him not. And Christ is the Holy One of Israel. Israel, guys. We're Israel if we want to be. If you want to be, if I want to be a Gentile, I can be a Gentile for as long as I want. I don't want to be a Gentile anymore. And inasmuch as I shall be, it shall be expedient. You must keep the performance. Ye must, notice how he's talking to you. Ye must keep the performances and ordinance of God until the law shall be fulfilled, which has been given unto Moses. Now, maybe I haven't done a very good job 
of saying it hasn't been fulfilled, but you guys know it hasn't. So he, uh, Jude, the brother of James, the brother of Jesus, said, Jude, Yehuda, servant of, the Yeshua, of Yeshua the Messiah, brother of Jacob, Yaakov, to you that are sanctified in God the Father, preserved in Yeshua Messiah, and to his called ones, to you increased grace and peace and love. Peace. That's Hebraic. I give my, I gave my whole heart, throwing myself into writing to you, my friends, regarding the matter of our <laughs> salvation. He's writing to you just like Moroni did. He's writing to you as if he's from the dust. Our salvation that is equal to all of us and necessary. And I write you and to warn you that you will contend and dispute the faith once given to the saints of a former time. You will have to fight. Maybe not other than peacefully, but you will fight. Book of Commandments, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, to conclude. And thus, if the people of this generation harden not their hearts. And by the way, this passage from the Doctrine and Covenants was never there. So it was never in the Doctrine and Covenants. It was never there. Somebody took it out. Why? I will work a reformation among them if they do not harden their hearts. And I will put down all lines and deceivings and priestcrafts and envyings and strifes and idolatries and sorceries and all manner of iniquities. And I will establish my church. <coughs> church. Uh, it's not a corporation, I don't think. Um, maybe, but... I'd rather have a congregation with you, something like this. This is what I'd rather be involved in. Like under the church, which was taught by my disciples in the days of old. You notice how um, we, uh, we talk about it, but do we really do it? Do we even know what we're talking about when we say teaching like the disciples of old? Do we teach Torah? I don't think so. It's been done away, right? Law of Moses, all that stuff. And now, if this generation do harden their hearts against my work, behold, I will deliver them up unto Satan. For he reigneth and hath much power at this time. For he hath got great hold upon the hearts of the people if this, of this generation. And uh, not far, not nor far, not far from the iniquities of Sodom and Gomorrah, do they come at this time. And behold, the word of justice hangeth over their heads. And if they persist in the hardness of their hearts, the time cometh that is, it must, it must fall upon them. Behold, I tell you these things, even as I told the people of the destruction of Jerusalem, and my word shall be verified at this time. You notice how even English uses funny tenses, and our mind corrects it, doesn't it? We know he's talking about future, aren't we? Yeah. Sounds like this time when the, doc, when the Book of Commandments was written. Not so. So stop correcting that those scriptures that say it's been fulfilled. It hath an end to me. Sure does, but you ain't there yet. And it hath hitherto been verified, as it hath hitherto been verified. So, yeah, I put a little note down here. I can't get into Thing. But I expect a restoration, nothing less than a full, honorable restoration of the Aaronic priesthood. We made that an abomination, sorry. And it is not what it should be. So I introduce to you now uh, an interesting fellow. Um, he's not uh, the usual kind of man. Uh, I won't call him Rav Eugene, but to me, he's Rob. He's a good guy. And uh, he'll teach us something about the Book of Mormon, about the Constitution, about what's coming. So please, uh, uh, Eugene lives in Burl and uh, lives off the grid. So, Eugene, why don't you come up? You got something 
But ask him about scripture, ask him anything, he'll give you an interesting answer. Never what you expect unless you've heard me a lot. And I'll two quick questions. What was the mitzvah tank? <laughs> the mitzvah tank? Yeah. Um it's a uh, place where they do outreach. So if you were um, a Jew like me, I'm, I'm constantly hit because I look like a Jew. And so they'll say, come in and let's tie the tefillim on you and do all the other things that they do. Your name is Jonathan. So then they, and I say, well, I'm a Gentile. Well, are you sure? And anyway, that's what they do. So they take you and it's like uh, a little... Uh, portable temple, a um, place for you to, for them to preach to you. To bring back the lost. To bring back the lost. And they're doing a good job. Yeah, they're doing a good job. They're the only missionary group I know of. Jewish missionaries. Yeah, envoys. Yaakov was a shliat, right? No, the last line is. What, what, what's the uh, corresponding? Uh, yeah, it's it's by. Yeah. Can I make a comment? Mm -hmm. That first sentence is really interesting. If the people of this generation are not their lives, I think that's an important statement. It is because they did. You want to ask me, see, John Kavadi, I stand as a messenger from Yahweh. I stand as some of the blood of the Nephites, the white Nephites. In Durian, which is below the Panama Canal and part of Colombia. There are white beings that have been there since before Columbus. The white Indians, some of them, migrated north and they get the ice shelf. They migrated east. They get the Atlantic Ocean. They found the Iroquois natives and then they went south after becoming part of the Iroquois. And they became the Chalagi, the Cherokee, the five bands of the Cherokee, and descended from the Kitua. The Kitua had been keeping the sacred fire that was lit by God and has never gone down. And right now that fire is in South Carolina. And it is the Kitua's job to hold the, um, what do you call it? We don't use it. Um, anyway, the sacred records, which is kept in peace. And it was mistaken for Indian money. And um, for lack of me, I can't remember. So, move on, my time is short. Anyway, the Book of Mormon was not written to the Gentiles, that the Gentiles had usurped it. The Book of Mormon was written to the entire house of Israel, the blood of Israel. The blood of Israel is not just here in America with the American Indians. The blood of Israel is usually the brown people all over the world. The most wonderful and strong group are the Mongols. The Mongol flag from um, Genghis Khan was a black flag. Ephraim's flag is a black flag. The Mongols say they're going to take the earth back and reconquer the world. <laughs> Who's supposed to take the world back? The royal house of Ephraim? There's so many things. The Book of Mormon, it's interesting. God says in all of Scripture, come out of Babylon, come out of Babylon. What happens? Okay, what's that mean? 
Everybody will give you a drink. Oh, we got to build the kingdom of God on earth. But how can you build the kingdom of God in a second? You can't. Because everyone is fully falling upon your head at all times. How can you be clean with everyone falling on you? So God gave us the Book of Mormon. Keep my people out of where you are and go someplace where there's no other people and be clean. Enoch had to do that and establish the city of Enoch. Moses had to do that. Abraham had to do that. And they all fell back into the world. So God had Lehi come out into a nation preserved for us to come back. It was the branch of the wall for the house of Joseph. And it was Manasseh. And it was Ephraim. Because the um, Ishmael was Ephraim. And his sons and his daughters that were married. <coughs> And then I was next. So the American continent, from the tip of the heart, all the way through <coughs> to the North Pole. Because believe it or not, before the 1400s, Antarctica used to be connected to America. All the old charts show. But that's all we want to say. Go ahead. But the good woman is more than just that because we're given certain Nephi. We're given the cycle, the Christ cycle, how people fell. And the world has gone through the Christ cycle, just like they did. But we're given something else, third Nephi. What happened in third Nephi? They were wicked. And they had to come out of their own society to protect themselves from the Gatlantans. And then they were attacked. And then they prevailed. And then they went back. And, they went, and the people fell apart into tribes. Because after they survived that, they still fell apart in worldliness. The Book of Mormon is our message. If you read all the scriptures about coming out of Babylon, that say, come out of Babylon, you won't find that which you want to book more. Because the Book of Mormon is the example we are to follow. It is a type. It's mentioned once in the Isaiah chapters. And it doesn't say come out. At, uh, I can't remember it now, but anyway, oh, here. <coughs> I have a handout. I didn't know how many were coming. Um, two handouts, actually. But this one, go ye forth, Babylon. It's Babylon. It's changed. Back in the 1600s, the British formed a law that started all corporations. I've got to bring you this because my time is running out. But basically, when you traveled the world back then, were gone for two to four years. During that time, someone would declare you dead. And then they would go in and steal your property. So what did they do? The French came up with Sescavi. And the British turned Sescavi into a law because of the Black Plague, killing most of the people. And after they died, they had problems getting the estates to the owner's descendants. So what they did is they passed this law and said, if you're declared dead and you can prove that you're the relation that's the inheritance where you're alive, you're not lost at sea, you're not dead, then you get your inheritance back and reparations for all damages that you've lost. Interesting law, beautiful. What does that matter today? Back in the Civil War, the United States became bankrupt. So in 1871, 
They wanted to get along. And the whole world laughed at them. You guys were defeated your own nation in that one contest. You still owe oh, us money from the last war. So how do you want to pay us? And then the Pope said, England, give America the loan and hold back. So the United States of America became a corporation with all of the same offices and officers and everything as the original, but it was no longer the United States of America. It was dead. It was a corporation. Now, that corporation has licensed all corporations. All corporations, because way back in the original founding, the only person people would trust was the Pope. So the Pope, if you know anything about corporations, corporations do not have an owner. They have a CEO. Why? Because all trust is given to the Pope. That means every corporation on earth is owned. Oh, sorry. Yes. I apologize. Now, this, what does this matter? 13 years ago, the Pope declared that now any corporation that I have control of, I'm going to go after the corporate presidents and controllers as crimes against humanity. And I can use papal law, which means the dark ages, the, the rack and killing and all of that. What does that mean? Next step. Three years, two years ago, the Pope called every business person of every major corporation on earth and had them swear fealty to him. Because he said, otherwise, I can have you killed. Why is that so important? Because he told them, right now, the whole entire earth is under electronic currency, except for five countries. Oh and when those five countries become fully electronic with ATMs and everything, I'm going to reset the economy of the earth. How many of you have heard about the Great Reset? Guess who's going to be in charge of that? The Pope. Now, something that happened in the American economy uh, way back in the 1930s. They monetized every person in America. All the property of America belongs to the corporation. You may think you own your land, but you don't. And if you look at your driver's license, your name is all in caps. That means you're a corporation, owned by the corporation. So when the Pope takes over control of the earth, you are his property. You are his slave. Now, the whole world, if you've ever watched Star Wars, when Palpatine was voting <coughs> of the world, everybody cheered. And Yoda said, so this is how a dictator takes control with cheering and applause. When the pro Pope takes over, he's gonna kill all these corrupt corporation heads. And the world is gonna cheer. Oh, all those greedy guys, we're not gonna be free of them. And a man of God is gonna be running the world. He's just proved he's gonna get rid of all of this greed and selfishness. You need to come out of Babylon. You need to become free of the corporation. How's that done? Well, number one, in this handout, the Lord talks about um, us having to go and flee into the wilderness. There's so many scriptures about fleeing into the wilderness And that means 
we're going to replay third Nephi. When they had to gather and they had to um, protect themselves from the Gadianton, those same scriptures talk how the world is going to attack. And when it does, there's going to be 16 men, Micah chapter 5, that stand against the Assyrian and save Israel with the power of the priesthood. This is not conjecture. This is scripture. It's there. Whether you accept it or not, that's something else. If you think it's my opinion and discount it, that's fine. It's your free agency. Right now, I'm in the process of becoming totally free. You get your birth certificate and you have it double authenticated. Stamped by the state you were born and stamped by the United States State Department. And there's a decree here that, surely, if you could hold one up. Um, yeah, that one. I didn't know how many would be here. I had 16 printed up. So one per household or one per group. But that's what I've had to submit to every federal agency. There's 15 of them. And when you submit that, you come out of the corporation. When you present it with your double authenticated birth certificate, then you're no longer part of the United States, which is a great thing, but it's a bad thing because you lose your social security. You lose all your government benefits, all your government, everything. You are on your own. Fear keeps people from doing that. How am I going to survive? On this other piece of paper, I go over the scriptures of fear. You know, Jonathan talked about Moses. That's the one mighty and strong. I've included scriptures here about the one mighty and strong. Um, Zechariah chapter 3, I believe. Yep. Zechariah chapter 3. The entire chapter is the Lord giving the power to the one mighty and strong. Right? And I have these to be handed out too. Unfortunately, two of them got lost somehow, so I only have 14. But we'll make copies so people can have them. What I'm saying is Babylon is going to, uh, not Babylon, Zion is going to be established as an Indian nation. Back in the early days of the church, they used to talk about the Indian prophet that was going to come, that's talked about. You read about him in 2 Nephi. Um, Lehi gives his son, Joseph, a blessing. And he continues the blessing. And it says, you shall be a servant like Moses, but not Moses. Greater. And you shall do many things to save the people in the last days. That's the son of Ephraim. Actually, he's gone by many names in scriptures. He's known as David. Uh, Joshua, the tower, the one mighty and strong, uh, Ephraim. But he's going to be a mixture. He has to be the blood of King David because King David was promised you will always have a son to sit on the throne. He has to be of Ephraim because Joseph was told you will have of your descendants be the royal house. That means Ephraim and Manasseh. Because that's Joseph's bloodline. Then he has to be Levi. In Ezekiel, we're told he has to meet with the Lord every day in the east gate of the temple that's coming. And he has to perform sacrifices. For everybody that says sacrifices are done away, God in Ezekiel says, I'm going to have you do sacrifices. How can they be done away if God in Ezekiel says, you need to do the sacrifices and put blood on the altar and do all this. Then in Malachi, God says, the sons of Levi will give an offering in righteousness. We have to come out of Babylon. Moses gave us um, in Deuteronomy. And Nehemiah, when he dedicated the temple, gave the same blessing. 
when the children of Israel that have been spread throughout the whole earth offer the offering in righteousness and return unto God, then is when God will save his people, gather them back to Israel, to the lands of their inheritance, and then God will come. In Exodus, we are promised, if you keep these commandments that I give you here this day, I will walk among you. <clears throat> I mean, any other place in scripture, sorry, any other place in scripture where God says, do this and I'll walk among you. Everybody is saying, God, we're waiting for you. We're waiting for you. And the Lord has told us in scripture, you want me to come? This is what you have to do. But are we doing it? No, that's been done away. Well, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, oh, it's done away, Father, so we don't have to do it, but we want you to come. Well, the Lord has told us in Scripture, come to me. Keep my commandments. Do what I have told you to do here, and I will walk among you. You know why we're going to go into the wilderness? Because people have been so stubborn. People don't obey until the day they're uncomfortable. So when everybody is dying, they're killed in the great nuclear war that um, Jeremiah and Isaiah and Micah talk about. You know, it's interesting. Seven women shall hold on to one man. How many polygamists love that scripture? But the chapter before talks, most of the men are killed in the war. And you know what? Their women, their hair is falling out. They've got pustulous boils all over their body, and they stink. My dad was Hiroshima in Nagasaki. He was in charge of all of the top secret documents that left there and came to Washington, General MacArthur's staff. I got a very particular upbringing. What Isaiah is explaining women in chapter three, that's what it looks like after a nuclear holocaust. It's coming. There's no if, ands, or buts. If you don't see the world falling apart, something wrong. What I'm telling you, not trying to scare you. Don't be afraid. Because if you're walking with the Lord, the Lord gives us something comfortable. When I come, they shall be like me. How many times have you heard that scripture? Well, the Lord says he's going to come in all of his glory as a fire burning. That means you're going to burn like he does, as hot as the sun. They drop a nuke on you. You're going to absorb it because you're going to be hotter and stronger than all the nuclear radiation and everything. You'll be one of God's people. There's nothing to fear. You'll have your manna. You'll have your provisions. And you'll have your protection. And like it says in Micah chapter 5, the 15 men will turn the tide back against the world when it comes to invade. And what are we told in scripture? Go not against Zion, for she is terrible. You have nothing to fear, so long as you obey God and keep his commandments. Three minutes. Now comes the part that I upset everybody. I'm always good at upset, upsetting people. Everybody practically, that's in this room is part of church. Not everybody, thank God. But if you are part of a church, you're in Babylon. Every LDS church is a 501c3. They do it to get their taxes. And you know what? You belong to anybody that's associated in a 501c3, your prophet is the Pope, whether you accept it or not. That's fact. So, come out of Babylon. 
really make Yeshua your head. Um, hand out here. Sean, if you and your friend, your partner here, sorry, I forget your name, I'm horrible, Jordan. Um, I have these, if you could come and pass them out to the head of people here. Surely if you could pass one over to the Erickson, one of each. Um, now, there's a small one and a big one, yeah. Uh, one to the head of a household, or if you're by yourself, just you get two documents. One is what I have declared to bring myself out of the corporation. Still not 100% complete. But right now, as I stand, I am not a U.S. citizen. I am a non-citizen national. That means I'm an American, but I don't belong to the American corporation. And I pray you do because I'm establishing a tribe that is going to be without the United States, not within their jurisdiction. So when everything hits, as it is going to, there will be a place that you can come that will not be in the United States. And you will be one of the tribes of Israel. As you'll read in my document that I have given my jurisdiction to Yahovah, the first jurisdiction of Adam. The American corporation declared everybody dead and lost its seat. And so that's how they made you a corporation. You're dead, you're lost at sea. You have to prove, I'm not dead, I'm not lost at sea. The K says V, or the says KV, does not apply to me, I'm flesh and blood. Now what's interesting, the naval flag with the gold around it is a maritime flag. But me, I'm descended from Adam who is made of the dust of the earth. I am earth, I am not at sea. And as earth, their corporation is a corporation over people at sea. Come out of Babylon, take the message of the Book of Mormon. So we can gather as a people that will be obedient to Yehovah and keep his commandments so he will walk among us and a pillar of fire will dwell over our heads and protect us. My time is up. I say this in the name of Yeshua, Mashiach, HaMashiach, and his father, Yahovah. Amen. Yes. I have a question. Mm -hmm. You know, Eugene, I appreciate your address. So you are making one of the, probably the most powerful statements on what you're wearing. Would you stand out here and show them your seat seal? Okay. The seat seal are really the most powerful statement to me you're making. Because you're telling me you're loyal to God and the Lord. And that's your first loyalty. It's not to any man-made institution. Right. And so what you're, what, what you're saying to me with your ZTO is that you're trying to be Torah observant. You're trying to follow the, the Torah commands and the law of God. Mm -hmm. And you're a citizen of, of God. You're not a citizen of an of a earthly institution. That's right. So that's really the, the most powerful statement that you're making to me. Every government of man has failed after a few hundred years. The longest was the Roman Empire, a thousand years. But they're gone. One kingdom, the Babylonian Empire, was established by Numerus. He himself a god. His wife, Samaramus, started the virgin birth thing. When she got pregnant, oh, the son being pregnant. That was my god husband. No. But all the holidays we celebrate go back to them. And there's been one shadow government behind every government since that time, the Masonic Court. And we have one. All governments, they come and go, but the Masons stay there behind the throne. You'll read my declaration, 
how I come out of that, and I take all jurisdiction from all of them. Uh, starting on page two of the 15 page document, going to page four. That comes from the congressional record on the bankruptcy of America, and it tells you how much America owns, and it tells you that we are all property of, America, of the corporation. So, anyway, yes, there's so much. Come out of that one. Come out of that one. And I hate to say this because God, Yeshua told his disciples when they condemned somebody, they wouldn't follow after us. And Yeshua said, condemn them not. For those that are not against us are on our part. So I'm not condemning any church out there, any religion. But you have to realize, any religion that's a 501c3, no matter what they believe, they're beholden to the public. Any other questions? Okay. Questions for Jonathan as well. One in the back room. I have a question for Jonathan. You mentioned a connection with Japanese, and I. Oh, that's my favorite. Good question. Jim, I love finding the evidence of Ephraim and Asa all over the earth. And Levi. And Levi. And the Japanese, uh, you may know this, you may not, but their writing system didn't come around until 500 AD. Think about that. You think of them as ancient, and they are. But their writing system was adopted from Chinese. Before that, there is evidence that Yeshua himself visited the islands. The islands being uh, Honshu, etc., Hokkaido. In this particular Honshu, the main island he visited after his resurrection, established disciples, and uh, did his work. But he gave them stones, and they wrote them on stones, the pre priests did. He gave them his gospel, and uh, the, the gospel stones, the main stone says, the people of us will save the world in a time of great need. And of course, that's a Joseph kind of statement, and uh, they're definitely been reserved and set aside for a deeper purpose. And I think it has to do with Levitical, Levites, and Ephraim both, as you'll find also in India. And uh, one thing I didn't bring was a box that I helped, you know, Joshua's helped me develop, Eugene's helped me develop. Uh, it's a box from the same wood, the Shatim wood, that Moses used to build the tabernacle that's harvested and grown and farmed in India. And they use it for their temples. Japanese use it for their temples. And it's a sacred wood. And this little box, little spice box, I'll be using to for fundraiser so that we can get some of our work done. So when you say Japanese, there's a part of speech called, they use all the time, it's ne, ne, na, na, ne, ne. And they want you to agree with them. Yeah, 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 na, ne, na, na. Hebrew has uh, the same na. You know, do this, nah, do that, nah. And uh, so I, I think, to me, that's a connection. Anybody else? Uh, you mentioned something about uh, going out and doing the tree. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I kind of agree with you in that if you're not willing to be deceived, you won't progress too much. Yeah. <laughs> well, progression, Joseph taught us, was... You know, at least in three levels, anyway. You have the telestial, which is this world, generally. You have the terrestrial, which is a higher form. And there's a couple things about it. If you'll notice in section 76, there's a description 
of a celestial person is a liar. Right? He's a deceiver. He's an intentional deceiver. And we do it all the time, believe it or not. We are constantly, intentionally deceiving one another for whatever our purpose is. Stop it. Start being honest. Figure it out that you're not pure in the Torah at all unless you're honest. You're not going to go see, you're not going to see, you're, the Lord is not going to present you to the Father. Not until you stop it. A terrestrial person is someone that can be deceived by the cunning of men, right? The craftiness of men. It's right there in section 76. So do not be an intentional deceiver and do not deceive yourself. That's a celestial person. I definitely have those celestial tendencies. So I am deceived and I deceive. Okay? But each time I go out, I get less deceived. I can be less deceivable. Because I've tried the spirits, just as John told us. Anybody else? Fair? Comment on that. Mm -hmm. If there are times when we don't tell all the <clears throat> You mean like um, casting your pearl before swine, that kind of, well, that kind of thing? Or like Christ, when you many times maneuver himself out of harm's way and tell the shower of it. Okay, and so that, right, so that's a distinction. Of deception, right? The, yeah, I'm just trying to say that just, just because you don't go out and kill your guts doesn't mean you're deceived. Although, you know, yeah. Although we should not be untrue. Yeah. Definitely think about every thought you have. You're either lying to God, lying to yourself, or lying to somebody else in all kind of ways. We've got to have a break now. Um, one of these 10 minutes, but let's try and make it five. So, restrooms, let's try and be brief. <laughs>